无上深深微妙法，百千万劫难遭遇。我今见闻得受持，愿皆如来真实意。The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma, in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons, is difficult to encounter. Now I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing. I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. <laughs> Okay, by golly, there we go. All right, hello everybody. Good evening in California. We're, uh, I'm here in Gold Coast, and we're in the middle of a rainstorm. Uh, it is storming, which is, in fact, a good thing, because we definitely need the water here. And we're trying our best to get the technology to work so that we can uh, look into the Buddha's wisdom together. So um, I'm actually experiencing a lag in my own speech. I think I'm seeing myself very much the way you are and I'm my mouth is about a second behind my own words which is a strange experience. How's the volume? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Um, all right. I actually, thank you, Michael, for requesting Dharma. I couldn't hear the assembly. Maybe you didn't have the mic on or something, but it's good to get feedback uh, from everybody. So um, as I, that way I can know if we're connecting. It's, it's quite a technological miracle that is going on. Last night I actually watched Marty uh, lecture, yesterday afternoon in fact, uh, at this time. And the, uh, the experience was quite satisfying. I mean I very much felt like he was there and uh, it was the fact that it was live, you actually forgot that it was on, uh, you know, being hosted around the world. It was very much a present experience so that was good. Now um, let's see if we can't replicate that and uh, I've got a bunch of things to share but first is the Avatamsaka Sutra invocation. So let's see um, we've already done this. Why don't we let me see if I can Oh, I know. I know where that is. Uh, it's on our text itself on the cover. So let's go here. And right now, I am on page 28 and 29. But here in the front of the sutra, let's see, that's actually 15 is where I want to be. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Close that and bring that up and up. And I happen to have a wooden fish right beside me. So let's see if I we can't uh, hold on a second. I can actually recite the way we do in the Buddha Hall. So the so master. We, yes, hi. Uh, on our side, we won't be reciting into the mic because of the lag, then what you hear okay. will throw you off. We, we'll we, because we can hear you, we'll just recite along on our side. Okay, without... sounds good. Yeah. Got it. Okay, here we go. Namo Dhafam Gampo Ayeng Ji Ayeng Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa Namo Dhafam Lampo, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. I am Jesus. 
15. There we are. We are back. Okay. I'm going to hide those. And then, okay, excellent. Now, um, I need to come back to go to meeting. And there we go. I'm not sure why my image, why the images get stuck there. That lack of bandwidth certainly is unattractive, whatever it is. There we go. Now I can see you all. Okay. Go to meeting control panel. Okay. Great. Now, um, here's where I want us to begin. Uh, Dhamma Master, we just lost your... We can see your desktop, but we don't see you anymore. I turned... I was stuck. My picture froze. So I dismissed my picture. I'll bring it back in a minute. Okay. So let's read this much text. That's a lot of Chinese, but we're covering material we've covered before. So let's start here with Yuju Fosso. Is that text big enough for you to see? Yeah, yes. Okay, and you also have it in hard copy there in front of you, right? Okay, so let's let's read this much text. I'm going to put my palms together and I'll just go ahead. Here we go. Um, let's do it in unison, so I won't wait for you because we won't try to play the, the, the time lag. Here we go. Yu Zhu Fo So Gong Jing Ting Fa Wen Yi Shou Chi De Ru Shi San Mei Shi Hui Guang Ming Sui Shun Xiu Xing Yi Chi Bu She Yo De Zhu Fo Shen Shen Fa Zang Jing Yu Bai Jie Jing Yu Qian Jie Nai Zhi Wu Yang Bai Qian Yi Nai You Ta Jie so yo shan gun, juan gung, ming jing. Piru jang jin, yi bi liu li bao, shu shu mo ying. Juan gung, ming jing. Si di pu sa, so yo shan gun, yi fu ru shi, yi fang bian hui, sui ju guan cha, juan gung, ming jing. Juan gung, juan fu, ji mie. Wu Neng Ying Bi, Pi Ru Yue Guang, Zhao Zhong Sheng Shen, Ling De Qing Yang, Si Zhong Feng Lun, So Bu Neng Huai, Si Di Pu Sa, So You Shan Gen, Yi Fu Ru Shi, Neng Mie Wu Liang, Bai Qian Yi, Na You Ta Zhong Sheng, Fan Nao, Shi Huo, Si Zhong Mo Dao, So Bu Neng Huai. Okay. Here we are. Okay, are we ready? Um, let's speak. Come back here. Where did you go? Oh my goodness. Ali, fly away. There we go. Okay, okay together. 
In the presence of all those Buddhas, he reverently listens to their dharmas, and having heard them, he accepts and holds them. He obtains the samadhi of true thusness and the light of wisdom, and accordingly cultivates. He remembers and retains them and does not abandon them. He furthermore obtains the treasury of profound dharma of all Buddhas. Passing through hundreds of kalpas, passing through thousands of kalpas, up to and including limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis, of nayutas, of kalpas, all of his good roots become ever brighter and more pure. This is just as true gold, when repeatedly polished with the gem Liduria, becomes ever brighter and more pure. All the good roots of the Bodhisattva on this ground are just the same way. Through his use of wisdom of expedience to accord and contemplate, they become ever brighter and more pure, evolve towards still extinction and cannot be obscured. This is just as the moonlight shines on sentient beings' bodies, bringing them pure refreshment, and the four wheels of wind cannot destroy it. All of the good roots of the Bodhisattva on this ground are just the same way. They can extinguish the raging fire of afflictions, of limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis, of nayutas, of sentient beings, and the four kinds of paths of demons are not able to destroy them. All right. There we go. And here we are. Share my book. There we go. All right. So now we're back. Okay. Now, can I ask, uh, am I visible to everybody? Yes. Hello. Hello there. Yeah, good. So I can see you all, and you can also see the text. The Chinese um, will refer to it as we need to, but important is to get the, uh, the English here. Let's let's spend some time with our text, figure out what's going on. Now we've uh, people know the context. You probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for uh, having, you know, had a connection to the sutra and got the backstory. But gently, briefly, this is the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka. It's the Ten Grounds chapter. We're in the sixth ground, and we're at the end of the sixth ground. Now, the ten grounds is about bodhisattva path. It's a primer. It's how to how to cultivate the way a bodhisattva cultivates, and it's um, high level instructions. This is not beginner stuff, because the ten grounds s positions itself in a larger structure of 52, sometimes 53 stages, and they are the ten faiths, the first ten, the ten dwellings, the second ten, the ten practices, the third tens, the ten transferences, the fourth tens, and then the ten grounds. So we're right up at the tip top of the Bodhisattva path, and this is the sixth out of ten, so it's past the middle of the tip top of the Bodhisattva path. So um, a lot is uh, assumed here. We're assuming that you understand where this is coming from. And where it's coming from in this particular section is wisdom, and it's prajna wisdom. And prajna wisdom is the crown jewel of the Bodhisattva path. You get to prajna wisdom through dhyana samadhi, through being able to meditate a long time, getting your body and mind really quiet. And that's hard. That's very hard to do because you have to do that instead of doing other things. You need to devote lots of time to, to sitting still uh, and to um, coping with all the things that come out of the mind when you're trying to sit still. So it's really, although your body might not be moving from one spot, in fact, your mind is traveling all over the place because you're coping with all the motions of the mind, gradually, one by one, um, chasing down all the bugs and uh, taming them, right? Bringing them into the family. 
So that's the experience of meditating a long time is your body's quiet but your mind is moving. And the goal is to dong, uh, jing, iru, movement and stillness, one single continuity, one piece. And hard to do, Agali, hard to do. Um, one of the reasons is, who do you know who's doing it? Well, I heard of somebody uh, somewhere, right? Right. Which is to say, nobody, pretty much. So if you decide that you're going to take on this path of cultivation, it's a pretty lonely path. There's not a lot of support around you. That's why communities like Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, City of 10,000 Buddhas, and the Sudhana Center, what it's going to become, um, and communities like DRBY, for example, our youth group, which is no longer in that incarnation, but uh, the group that gathers around Buddha Root Farm and the group of friends who went to the Parliament of World's Religions, those communities become super, super important. They're a lifeline to anyone who hears the sound and says, yeah, I want to keep that in the world. Who does that? Uh, the answer is, anybody can, very few do. And if you can find friends who do, you got a treasure, and you should stick with them and support them and let the little petty daily stuff go because the bigger picture is really, really important, really valuable. Um, for example, here where I am in uh, southeastern Queensland, the community is launching today into a week-long uh, Sharangama Mantra session. We're reciting the Sharangama Mantra for eight hours a day for a week. And, wow, that's, that's hard. That's hard to do. My guess is, of the people who will be taking part, probably fewer than a quarter of them have it memorized. And that means that three-quarters of them are going to be like this. The experience of the session is book in your face. You know, I've, let's see, they were on Di San Hui, I'm lost again. I wish they'd slow down so I could find my place. You know, that's that's what it's like when you're reciting a 15-minute mantra, and you haven't memorized it. Is you're lost in the book somewhere, and by about day number six, you kind of catch on to pieces of it. And the result, however, if if you're willing to put up with that kind of um, struggle to to you know, to work with the actual mantra itself, because it's long, 15 minutes long. The, the, the benefit of that, the result of that, is an energy and a power, because mantras generate power, they're all about vibrations, a power that you don't get any other way. There's no other way to gather that energy from the mantra than by reciting it. So, uh, they're going to be doing that. And, of course, foremost in the mind here is the new Buddha Hall, which is being built um, on our back portion. Um, we need it. It's Our current Buddha Hall is full, pretty much, most of the time when we have events like this. And it's that Queensland is ready to support a larger Buddhist uh, sacred space. So reciting the mantra has the purpose of kind of um, energizing that work. And every time, in my experience, every time the, we call it the proper dharma, the right dharma, the traditional way of doing dharma, every time that comes into a new community, there is a, a commensurate reaction from what you could call the improper dharma. Um, it's not uh, the invisibly in the world, the realm of spirits. The, um, there's a steady state balance uh, held. And when the proper dharma makes an advance, either the negative forces of the universe, you know, I'm talking in a in a, an invisible realm, and I if you ask me to prove it, I can't prove it, but um, 
I know that uh, there's pushback from the negative side. And so to have the positive mantra being recited with vigor for a week by uh, devoted, sincere people, it creates a really wholesome presence. And uh, I heard Master Hua um, talk about how he was listening to his tapes uh, at lunch here, and he was talking about how when he brought um, Gold Mountain Monastery and the Buddhist Lecture Hall into San Francisco, he published Vajra Bodhisi, our magazine, um, with syllables, lines from the Shurangama Mantra on the cover with the express purpose of notifying the negative presences in the Bay Area that the proper Dharma had arrived. And when he was talking about it, you you really had the feeling of uh, the sheriffs in town uh, notify all the, the bad guys and the, the bandits that they better move out or else. And they moved out. And when Sherpa was talking about it, it's very matter-of-factly, you know, the way we would kind of talk about somebody taking a vacation uh, to Florida or to, to Mexico or something. And he said, no, they they saw those. And they, they split. You know? So, okay, Sherpa, you can say that, you know. We'll, we'll take it from you. you. Don't take it from me. So anyway, that's what's going on here. And the digression was from the idea that um, to find people who support your interest in cultivating the bodhisattva path the way it was done traditionally, if you can find those people, stick with them and support them because they're rare. And the places where that is done, that you can do it without stress, without uh, stigma, without flack, without struggle, uh, or rarer still. So, in the presence of all those Buddhas, this Bodhisattva reverently listens to their dharmas. Having heard them, he accepts and holds them. He hears about cultivation and decides that he's going to follow it. He obtains the samadhi of true thusness. Um, true thusness. In our Six Patriarch Sutra translation, okay, uh, Chin Shen sitting there happily in the back, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, you were on the lecture, do you recall how we translated that in the Sixth Patriarch Lecture? I don't. Do you, do you remember? Was it true reality? It wasn't Sorry, suchness. I, I didn't remember. <laughs> you don't remember it at all. Okay. Both of us go down zero points to either you and me. Okay. Let me see. Here's what I can do. Ah, uh, not there. All right. Here we go. Be patient. This is worth it. It's worth it. Hang in there. Uh, da da. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Let's see here. Dharma talk right there. Okay, sixth patriarch right there, and here we go. So hang in there. This is another PDF, and we were shoot. I can remember. Oh, too far. Was it? see here. This is worth it because this is a term that most of us blink at when we read it. It's one of those uh-huh terms. And Marty, Professor Verhoeven, and I came up with an alternative to our traditional. And I think it's an improvement. Okay, we're getting there. Right in. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, hold on here. 
Free vehicle, background infinity, go to the edition of the dharmas. Okay. Let's see here. We're talking about good and wise advisors. And I realized it's interesting that both Marty and I are explaining the Six Patriarch Sutra online. How interesting. I hope he doesn't interpret it as competition. Um, and in fact, I get a lot of inspiration from listening to him. It just came up that we are happen to be explaining the same text. Let's see here. Grasp my eternals. Cultivate a mind doesn't clean inside outside freely. Diamond Sutra. Okay, we're getting there. Patience. Dharma teachings. Therefore, myriad Dharma teachings. Deluded, wise, deluded, small. Here we go. Uh, okay. The true... Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Right there. It's... Okay. We're going to take that out. Copy it. Go here. Ah, excellent. Okay, thank you, Six Patriarch. Okay, here we go. So, take a look here. This, oops, this is one of those texts, one of those terms that you kind of go, mm hmm, I think I understand. Take a look. One fa jin zai zi xin. There. 10,000 dharmas entirely in own mind. Why not from own mind within directly see jun ru ban xin? Jun ru, right there. Why not directly see jun ru fundamental nature? So, good and wise friends, awakened Buddhas, momentary awakening beings become Buddhas. Therefore, you should realize that the 10,000 dharmas are all within your own mind. Okay. go. Yes. Okay. Now, thanks for waiting while I got this all together here. Here's the idea. Why don't you, says the Sixth Patriarch, this is not the Ten Grounds chapter, this is the Sixth Patriarch, why don't you immediately see, right within your own mind, there it is, the true reality of of your original nature. Marty and I took these words, Jun Ru, and translated as true reality. Okay. It has been translated traditionally as true suchness. And I maintain that nobody knows what suchness is. And we have always just kind of nodded as that goes by and go, yeah. The Matthews Chinese English Dictionary says Ru is such. And so we took it. Am I wrong? Can anybody make a good case to, for preserving true suchness for Jun Ru? You know what the Sanskrit is? Ta ta ta, which doesn't help at all. That's one of the funniest sounding Sanskrit words. Ta 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 ta. Doesn't help, right? What in the world is Junru? Where do we meet it? We meet it as Rusher. Right? This is in uh, Master Hua in his encounter with Master Xu Yun. Um, when he met our grand teacher, he said, Ru Shur. 
And Master Shuyin said, Ru Shir, that's what it is. So it is, he said. And, and Shifu wrote a verse where he said, I saw Master Yun, and he said, so it is. He saw me and said, so it is. And we want all living beings to be just like this. Okay? So, how did this become true suchness? It's a major important idea in the Buddha Dharma. This is, this is, what could it be? This is the equivalent of God. Okay, that's how powerful it is. Is God central to theistic religions? Yeah, he's the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? He's the source, he's the power, he's the truth, he's the ultimate, he's the all in all, the divine, it's what we hope to return to, it's the thing that makes us alive and spirit sacred, it's the thing that allows us to go out of pain into ultimate bliss and all. That's God, okay? Well, Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teaching, points to this direction. He says, yeah, we've got it too. It's here. Don't look out there. Look here. And it has a name. If you had to name it, probably you couldn't do much better than Junru Banshin. Your true, like, fundamental nature. Got translated in English as true suchness. That is too puny. That's too. It's a punt. You know, you punt the football back without actually trying to score with it. Am I ranting on in a vacuum? Anybody agree? You're all looking at your feet there. I want somebody to say, "You're right. You're right, Dharma Master. I absolutely agree." Yes. And we the agree. kookaburras in the neighborhood. I agree. There we go. Uh, yes. Yes. Such kookaburras go. No and the turkeys go rock, 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 rock. So anybody like, why am I getting worked up about a translation? It's because this is like the power word. And to say true suchness and go, that's just too puny. That's not enough. So Marty and I bit the bullet and translated it as true reality. Let's look at our feet some more. Our feet are very interesting. Here, yeah. That's good. I like my feet. They attach me to the ground. So true reality, that's, that's what we came up with. And that, you know, somebody will go, well, what do you mean by true reality? What about reality? Yeah, it, as if, as if there were a true reality. But here's the sixth patriarch saying, yep, Look for it. It's there inside. You can see it. Now, that's not the only name for it. It has, you know, you could also probably call it the Tao. And you wouldn't be far away. The Tao. Okay? We're talking about the same thing. Is that it's invisible. It doesn't really have a name. But... The Sixth Patriarch is saying it's fundamental, it's in your nature, it is your nature, and you we belong to it as much as it belongs to us. Okay, all right, so I'm pounding on something that people probably don't need to have pounded on. But let's take a look again, and here's, he says... The samadhi of true thusness. No. A samadhi of true thusness? Is there a false thusness? That's it's just it's needs work. It needs to be chewed on because it's it's central. It's really important. Okay. He obtains the samadhi of true reality and the light of wisdom. And he cultivates them when he is able, accordingly. He remembers and retains them, meaning what? The teachings of all those Buddhas, their dharmas, and doesn't abandon them. He keeps on cultivating. 
what he heard. Okay, so comment here. What we're finding out is that our bodhisattva is a student of the Dharma. That's really key, I think, in the description here. Bodhisattvas learn the Dharma um, up until they become Buddhas. They're always learning. And the Avatamsaka somehow gives us that feeling of people together learning from the Buddha and learning from each other because they intend to take what they learn out and teach with it. I really like that, that they are um, kind of eternal, eternally docile, D-O-C-I-L-E, in the sense of able to be led. You don't get a sense of the Bodhisattva being a, a superhero um, star. He's made it, the winner. Bodhisattvas together with people asking about the Dharma. He's investigating, looking into it, and refining his or her understanding. So what does that mean? He's admitting to things he doesn't know yet, or she doesn't know. Which I that's that attitude is always so healthy. It's like, no, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Right? And that was really the experience that we had around Master Hua, around Shrifu was that he was interested in stuff. He, he said once, he said, I would be a really, really good computer coder, he said. He said, it's just, it's just duality, just like the I Ching. It's binary, the broken line and the solid line of the I Ching. The book changes. He says, I get that. He said, I see how that would work. He said, I could make some interesting things with computer code. And Shurful, whenever anybody came in um, who had knowledge, scientists or doctors or uh, experts, Shurful would, you had a kind of feeling that he, his mind was like just pulling their knowledge. If they were artists or musicians, experts, he was drawn to them and he would inspire them to be even better at what they were doing. That was that was this the feeling around Master Hua was his mind was always learning, always ready to learn. Okay, got it. What else? He furthermore obtains the treasury of profound Dharma of all Buddhas. So he gets a treasury. In other words, the Buddhas give this Bodhisattva things. He's been through stage five. What was stage five? Samadhi. And what was the thing about samadhi? If people remember, the fifth ground was sound, mantras, and memory. Uh, in the fifth ground, the bodhisattva was able to do all kinds of wonderful things. He had worldly knowledge there, and he remembered stuff. His memory was good because his samadhi was solid. So he further obtains the treasury of deep dharma of all the Buddhas. So he's really got something now. He keeps it in his mind. He's got uh, hard drives that are backed up constantly. He passes through hundreds of kalpas, thousands of kalpas, up to including limitless, hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas of kalpas. What's a kalpa? Kalpa is an eon. What's an eon? An eon is... Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Got to do this here. Hang on. Don't go away. Uh, let's see here. Eon. I wonder if they spell it with an A or with an E. A E O N. Let's try. How about E O N? E O N. Eon. How long is an eon? Okay. Alternate spelling of eon. An indefinite. Okay. An eon. American spelling is E-O-N, uh, British, I guess, A-O-N. Period of time, an age, sometimes, forever, limitless, eternally. It's a Latin translation from the Koine Greek, from the archaic A-O-N. In Homer, so it's Greeks called it 
a life or a lifespan. Um, okay, here we go. Um, in astronomy, an eon is called a billion years, 10.9, 10 to the ninth power, a billion years. Um, so there's lots of eternities and ages. Philosophy uses it. Gnosticism uses it. I was looking, I guess 10 to the ninth power is what we're going to have to use here. Okay, so a billion years, that's what the, the uh, Wikipedia tells us is an eon represents a billion years, 10 to the ninth power. So he goes through hundreds of billions of years, thousands of billions of years, up to and including limitless hundreds of thousands. A koti is an Indian number with actual zeros. A nayuta is an Indian number with an actual number of zeros of billions of years. And all of his good roots become ever brighter and more pure. So the bodhisattva continues to cultivate over all this time. And his good roots become brighter and more pure. Good roots. What about good roots? Good roots mean the best qualities inside us. Um, Six Patriarch again. Six Patriarch said the best part about hanging around a good teacher, we're at that point in the Six Patriarch Sutra where he's talking about Shan Jirshi, Kalyana Mitra, good teachers. And he says the best part about being around a good teacher is he brings out the best in you. Right? And what is your best? Interesting. Do you know? What are you capable of? Um, today I taught a meditation class. We had a large number of Aussie folks. Had over 30 plus, almost 40 people today. And I was introducing the idea of full lotus. <laughs> and most of these folks don't bend their legs that way. They're, the idea that this is possible, new idea. Why? These are not floor-sitting people. Growing up in northwestern Ohio, I was not a floor-sitting person. I sat in chairs. I sat on sofas. I sat on stools. I sat on benches. Right? It's cold. You don't sit on the ground that much. So as a result, where are you going to cross your legs if you sit on a chair all the time? It, it, your people laugh at you if you do that. If you relate to the floor more, the idea of um, how do you sit on the floor? Well, you could cross your legs. Ah, so people do that. Um, yoga cultures. Yoga is done on the floor. People tend to do full lotus more. Now, um, the Chinese, the north north of China, very, very cold. People sit on heated beds called a kong, right? A brick bed that has a fire under it. So the floor is raised. It's a raised platform. So And you're sitting there on that platform because that's the warm part of the house. So you can cross your legs. It's, you, you see that done. Um, Ted Berger, our, our good friend who's made the film about Jun Ru, True Reality Monastery, no longer True Suchness, right? True Reality Monastery, Jun Ru Su, on Cloud Dwelling Mountain in Jiangxi Province, called One Mind. In his One Mind film, he does something very special. He takes the camera into the Chan Hall. And if you think about it, when have you ever seen monks doing a real Chan sit in China. Now, CTDB, the women's side, men and women both do Chan sits, but in the traditional Chan halls of China, you don't get to see that, right? Cameras don't go in there. So here's Ted Berger getting permission from uh, Chunmen, Da He Shang, to take his camera in to Chan Ru Si. And, uh, oh boy, what do the monks do? They sit back on their, this, the, their, they live 
on their meditation platform. It's called a dan. And they, they eat there, they sleep there, they meditate there because it's deep. It's a deep platform. And when it's time to sit, they sit, they lean back and tuck their robes under their legs. In other words, they cross their legs in full lotus and then wrap their robes around it because why? They're not going to move. <laughs> and you see it and you go, gulp. They wrap their robes tight around their legs so you don't come out of full lotus until, until the sit is up, until the incense is burned all the way down. And you go, whoa, these are marines. These are the marines of meditation. Uh, it's assumed that you're going to sit in full lotus. Okay, so I'm digressing again. Back to teaching meditation at Gold Coast Dharma Realm this morning. And I said to folks, I said, okay, now, the question came up. Somebody asked a question. They said, what do I do when my legs hurt? Aha, number one, that's a really good sign that you are sitting. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that that's possible. Your legs hurt mm -hmm. if you're really meditating long. That's normal. It's not a bad sign, but you still need to know what to do. And I said, Master Hua always emphasized full lotus. That was like number one best choice. And there wasn't really a second choice. That was the best. And he kind of, you know, the atmosphere was there that he expected you to sit in full lotus. And, of course, we couldn't, you know, we're just... American hippie kids. And so we don't try it though because it was fun and Americans are into that. You know, we'll try it. So we tried it and it hurt and we drop into half lotus. You do half lotus until you couldn't do it anymore and you drop into no lotus, cross legged. And as soon as you were at that point where you're struggling with the pain in your legs and you got your eyes shut and you're like, thinking, another minute, another minute, I can't wait. And you think, okay, that's it, I'm going to drop my legs. You'd open your eyes, and there would be Shurfu standing in front of you with a smile. Like that, you know. And you go, oh, maybe I'll just sit here. Maybe I'll be patient. And sure enough, somehow the pain is gone, you know, for another 10 minutes. And then you're back to struggling with your pain. So I said to them, Master Hua really emphasized full lotus. And I'm clear that many of us, I've never tried this before. This is a whole new idea. How long can you sit before the pain begins? And it's different with everybody. So can you do 10 minutes before your legs hurt? Then here's my suggestion. Try 12 minutes and do it scientifically. Do it systematically. Take a clock and or your wristwatch or your phone. We have, this is our, here is our, new clock. We don't have clocks anymore. We have these things, right? So take your clock and go 12 minutes and wait that extra two minutes to where you can't hold it and then drop your leg down to half lotus. And then say, okay, this time next week, 14 minutes. And give yourself another two minutes per week if you sit every day. And really do it and watch your, you know, see how you can do and say, okay, in a month, I will have added eight minutes. So in December, around Christmas time, I will, or New Year's, I will have added almost 10 minutes to my full lotus. And then this time next year, guess what? I'll be able to sit as long as I want to sit instead of as long as my legs allow me to sit. Your legs will listen to you because you kept your bargain, and you didn't try to go faster, just two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. And I said, see what you are capable of. I'll bet you don't know what you're capable of. We need a new normal. Most of us, I don't want to generalize that way, many folks, um, take as normal whatever the environment pushes them to. Um, for example, what's normal now? Normal is sleeping 
at arm's length with your cell phone, with your smartphone, just in case, right? You might get a Twitter update before the sun rises. Or you want to check your email, or you're waiting for a Black Thursday sale, that email to come that tells you the sale is on. We sleep with arm's length of our phone. Five years ago, nobody did that. Ten years ago, it was unheard of. There weren't smartphones. So how quickly we adopt to a new normal, right? We adapt a new normal. So if we can take as normal the idea that looking at our minds is okay to do, that part of every day will include sitting still, there's a new normal. Now, if you're the only one doing it, it's not normal, but it's your new normal. And then from there, you ask yourself, what am I, can I sit still for half an hour with my legs crossed? Is that possible? I don't know anybody else. The cool kids are not doing that. Right? So you give yourself a new normal. Say, I'm going to see what I'm capable of. And if we challenge ourselves in that way, we really don't know what we're capable of doing. What if normal for us becomes quiet mind, where there are actual gaps between the chatter, where things are still, and the, I, the floating up of thoughts is unusual? Right? Why? Because the good advisor brought out your best wholesome qualities called good roots, right? Good roots. What's a good root? I have no idea what a good root is. Are there bad roots? I do know about wholesome qualities. Your best. Good and wise advisors, says the Sixth Patriarch, bring out your best. Bring out the best in you, right? And you don't necessarily have to subdue the bad. You just emphasize the good. And the bad, after a while, seems not worth doing. That's really my experience. Okay. What I want to do is to have uh, Jin Husher hand the microphone over to Stephen and to have Stephen give us a couple of vignettes from Taiwan. Welcome back. Uh, what was the best part? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not here yet. <laughs> You're not here yet. You've been. Yeah. How, when did the plane arrive? Uh, nine in the morning today. Right. Yeah. So. Right. So I I followed your exploits on Facebook, seeing all these incredible places I'd never seen in Taiwan, and you were there with Sarah. Yeah, it was it was pretty amazing, uh, and the contrast is pretty stark in a lot of ways. Um, the worst part for me has been. Um, understanding again what people are saying um, and it happened on the on the bus ride um, from to the airport and there were some guys in the, and all of a sudden uh, they were talking about you know just bro stuff and all of a sudden I'm like understanding what people are saying and it was just like this is the worst it was so pleasant for almost three weeks to have no idea what people were saying and to <laughs> and as a result to not care what people were really saying because it, it just I didn't get pulled into anybody else's crap, and I couldn't really say anything to anybody except "thank you," uh, "excuse me," um, "shishi." Yeah. You know, I, I it was fine. I didn't do or say anything for three weeks, and it was wonderful. And now I'm back, and mm -hmm. people want me to talk on the microphone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it was—it it really was—it was a surprise how absolutely pleasant that that was, and that could be. Um, I was also surprised by just how polite everybody was. Mm. Um, everybody feels like this, you know, the bathrooms are clean. It's clean because people want it to be nice for the next person. So when you right. see, like, I, I was, uh, you know, on the on the Jayun and the, on the subway, and there's signs like, you know, don't eat on the subway, don't smoke on the subway, kids, essentially because it's not nice to the other people you're with. You know, mm -hmm. in America, same sign. You hear the on the on the bar, don't smoke on the bar, don't don't eat, or you're gonna get a fine. You know, <laughs> and, and so it's just it's kind of like it's different. 
um, there's like a low level tension, anxiety, anger that sort of is present and that is not present so much in Taiwan that is present here. So I've just found the whole experience to be kind of relaxing and um, pleasant and not a lot of emotional tension that came up from interacting. It was, it was really refreshing. Great. Yeah, thanks for sharing. This was Stephen's first visit to Taiwan, so he saw it fresh. And, and of course, Sarah was there too, so that made it all the nicer you could share it with somebody. It was nicer. Yeah. I think it would have been difficult if, you know, if, I mean, my love of not being able to be understood uh, would have diminished rapidly uh, if Sarah wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, and Dharma Drum, uh, one of the one of the places that Stephen visited is a very nice campus, and Beautiful. that's what a Buddhist institution can become, you know. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Massive. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Appreciate that. Get some. Get some rest. Get some sleep. You. You may take a a, a week to really find yourself back because your your essential nature is somewhere in the air in between, right? Um, Something I can recommend that I've just discovered, thanks to Marty, is dried cherries. Highly recommended. And you gotta, ideally, it's a, uh, as a, uh, not an antidote to, but a helper for jet lag. Because jet lag has to do with melatonin, the, that uh, it's in the skin and the, the system. And you can either get dried Bing cherries or dried tart cherries. Trader Joe's up the street has them, little, just a little package. And you start eating them like two days before you get on the plane. Just take a little mouthful every now and then. And then you eat them on the plane. And then you eat them like two days after. And it's amazing how it cuts through jet lag. So I've, I'm a believer. I, I, uh, took them the last two trips and the jet lag was substantially reduced the impact so okay forward into the text here oops there we go all of his good qualities are brighter and more pure and he learns that he actually can sit in full lotus and his mind is quiet now two analogies we hear about gold and the moonlight it's uh, what is it talking about? It? How the Bodhisattva's nature responds to hearing the Dharma from the Buddhas. And what does he do with it? This is just as true gold when repeatedly polished with the gem Vaiduria. Vaiduria. Vaiduria is lapis lazuli. And oh, 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 there's a scholastic, a polite, very polite scholastic disagreement about whether Liuli is Viduria or Lapis Lazuli and I remain unconvinced by either side. I, is, you know, Viduria is a substance, Lapis Lazuli is a substance, are they the same thing? So this is a question that translators, translators need to pay attention to because what is the, the Buddha talking about in the Avatamsaka Sutra? Just as true gold as opposed to false gold, fool's gold, right? In other words, gold, 24 karat gold, when repeatedly polished with the gem Viduria, becomes ever brighter and more pure. All right, gem smithing. We've talked about this before because it comes up regularly at the same part of every ground, of the 10 grounds here, not everyone, many of them, as an analogy for how the Bodhisattva's studies are going. How's your cultivation progressing? Well, says the sutra, my cultivation is getting brighter the way gold, when it's smelted, becomes ever more golden. Think about that. The gold that you have in a ring maybe, or a necklace, or a watch, or a figurine, or something. Some people have gold, you know, in their, in their life. That gold may not have been refined to its ultimate point before it was fashioned into the thing that you love, the beautiful thing. And maybe it was. 
but uh, the sutra knows about smithing gold, gold smithing. And if you mix it up with lapis lazuli, apparently, or viduria, it becomes, you, you lose the, the dross that is mixed in with the gold, and what's left behind is even brighter. Okay, that's the, the, the picture that it gives us. And all of the wholesome qualities on the, of the bodhisattva on this ground are the same. Because he uses wisdom and expedient means to accord with living beings and to watch them, so his wholesome qualities become brighter and more pure. And, oh no, they do not evolve towards still extinction and cannot be obscured. What a terrible translation. Try again. Chuan Fu Chi Ming Di. Okay. Let's try this again. Going towards still extinction. Wow. Okay. Turn. Oops. Turn. Again. Quiet. Uh, gone. Or extinguished, put out, and then semicolon, none, able, darken, block. Okay, talking about wholesome qualities, his good roots. Okay, so Zhuan Fu means repeatedly. In other words, progressively. Qi Mie. Qi Mie is a compound which is used for nirvana. Not, what is it? Extinguished, still extinct, right? Progressively towards ultimate stillness. Wunang Ying Di. Nothing blocks this progress. Nothing can stop this progress or pr progress, process, even. Sat buzz wholesome qualities. How did it go? Let's see here. Uh, they become oops, sorry. They become ever brighter and more pure. Evolve towards still extinction. Mm -mm. They become ever let's see. Through his use here. Okay. Right. They become ever brighter and more pure. Ever brighter, oops, sorry. And more pure. Bodhisattva's wholesome qualities. There we go become ever brighter and more pure. They, they advance progressively towards ultimate stillness and nothing can stop this process. Okay, Jin Chuan, what do you think? Much better. Thank you. I'm glad you agree. Okay, so we want the English to actually make sense and we shouldn't be satisfied until it does, right? Why be satisfied with evolve towards still extinction? That's meaningless. Okay, second analogy. Oops, keep losing our 
picture here. There we go. This is just as the moonlight shines on sentient beings' bodies, bringing them pure refreshment. There we go. All right. Oy. Yep. Bringing them pure refreshment, and the four wheels of wind cannot destroy it. Okay. The moonlight shines on sentient beings' bodies. Yes. Uh, if you've ever been out under a full moon, there is a sense of coolness. Bringing them qing liang, making you feel pure and cool. And the four wheels of wind cannot destroy it. The four wheels of wind, I look them up, and they are, uh, it's a Buddhist cosmological reference to things that turn and in absence. It's, it's a difficult reference. And there, uh, there is a feng zai. There is a time when the kalpa, when the eon comes to an end, that these wheels actually blow apart the world up to a certain level of heaven. The four wheels of wind can't harm the moonlight. The moonlight is immune to wind wheels, which destroy other things. Analogy... All the bodhisattvas' wholesome qualities on this ground are the same way. They can extinguish the raging fire of afflictions of limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis and nayutas of sentient beings. Okay. What is that like? It's talking about um, the bodhisattva is such a good person that he can bring peace of mind to lots of people lots of living beings. This is an Avatamsaka style number. Limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas. That's a lot. You just translate it as many. Right? Many. Many sentient beings raging fires of afflictions. Anger, grief, fear. He can put it out. Yeah. Um, I, since I came back from China and Taiwan, I've been catching up on news, and um, I've been watching uh, our president a lot, and because he's he's active, and I have to say that I think history is going to be very very kind to our president, because it history is going to look at the. Uh, struggles that he has with Congress that is intent upon destroying him and he doesn't quit and when he is at his best um, I feel reassured you know he's he has a very presidential quality of responding to certain circumstances situations that put my mind at ease because why? There's a smart man in charge. He's an intelligent uh, adult male who is worthy of admiration, who gives me the feeling that he's he, he's got it under control in circumstances. When you know he's being his, uh, the, he calls himself the consoler in chief, and um, there's an, a, a ready ready example of someone who can um, extinguish the raging fires of afflictions for many living beings simply by being there at the right time for the disaster, uh, you know, saying the words that we want to hear that give us a feeling of unity of purpose and a sense of security. So our current president does a really good job of that. And you never have the feeling that he's flying by in an airplane, kind of looking out the window, not getting his feet dirty. Um, he's there, and he knows what's happening, and he's willing to take it on. And uh, it's, it's really heartening to see that happen in a national sense. Can you imagine what the bodhisattva is like in a spiritual sense? to give you the feeling that this is going to be okay. Okay. 
the four kinds of paths of demons are not able to destroy them. Let's see what that says in Chinese. It says, The four kinds of demons. That's poorly translated. Just the four kinds of demons. And four kinds of demons, there is the demon of death, there is the demons of affliction, there is the demon of sickness, and there is the hardest one of all, demon of your own nature. Let's, let's look at that bunch. That's, that's worth reviewing. Progress. Here we go. So the Chinese is si, right? Si zhong mo mo dao. Let's see, one, we'll do the Chinese first and then translate it. So there is uh, si mo. There is, I think some people call it Bing Mo. There is Fan Nao Mo. Fan Nao. Oops. Now, there we go. And, more. and okay, we'll translate these in a minute. And last is Zi. Xing. Uh, or Xing. There we go. It's the Xing. All right. Here they are. Um, four kinds of demons. Uh, now, there. This is. Um, there is a dispute about these. Death. The demon of death. The demon of sickness. Some people put those two together. The demon of afflictions and demon of one's own nature, your own nature. Now, the one, let's, I'll put it as five. Demons of the heaven. Davis. <clears throat> it's five there because there's a dispute about the number and the sequence of these Tianmo, as in Tianmo Wai Dao, right? So um, some people put these two together. And then Actually, some people make these first. Tianmo is first. Anybody want to contribute here? Correct me or suggest. Oops, death. There we go. Maybe what would be clear for the demons of your nature would be the demon of the skandhas. I think the actual Skanda Sanskrit is skandamara skanda or skandamara. Okay. Do you have a list there? Uh, yeah, I have the Sanskrit. It's pretty much the same What's as Chinese. Of all four, which how does how does your list list them? Skandamara, Kleshamara, Devaputramara. And Ritumara. So Skandamara is the Skandas. Klesha is affliction. Devaputra mm -hmm. is the son of God, which I think is the, right. the heavenly head demons. And then the right. Ritu is death. Death, okay. So, yeah, uh, so the, the one that is we disagree on is the illness, the demon of sickness. And I've, I've heard that... Um, 
often invoked. So here's here is a here's a list. And what is what's your source, Gene Schwancher? That's oh sorry. That's Monier Williams. Monier Williams is a Sanskrit Monier Williams. dictionary. Okay. Monier Williams is a, a reliable source of Buddhist Sanskrit. Um, so the order of these probably matters. And let's see if we can get the order right. Uh, he had afflictions as second. And these as fourth. Okay, now why is this interesting and why, why do we care? Why are we taking time? Well, it comes up in the sutra. Here's a list, right? And lists are an important part of Buddhist practice. We do lots of things. The 42 hands and eyes, there are 42 of them, aren't there? So, um, afflictions is second, he says. So there's lots of lists in Buddhism, and one of the fun parts of being able to do this online is that um, I've got at my fingertips this word processor, so I can show you text that I can't do if I'm sitting in, um, let's see, this is number four, if I'm sitting in the Buddha hall, I don't have the computer under my fingers, so having it here, I can show you these ideas as they pop up. All right, so here's our list. Four kinds of demons. What do we say? We say, oh, so-and-so caught a demon. There we go. Hard to say. Chinese tongue twister. Somebody caught a demon, we say. Oh, somebody got a demonic state. What is it talking about? Well, if we're following traditional descriptions, it will be in that list. That whatever state that is, that person has caught, quote, that is making them behave in a way that we don't trust, that we're afraid of, it's going to be connected to those states. So it's either coming out from transformation of the skandhas Probably not the case. Why? You have to be a really, really good meditator before the skanda demons start to affect you. Is it an affliction? Usually yes. Usually yes. Demon of afflictions. Is it a tien mo? Could be. We hear about, uh, Shrifu talks about tien mo, wai dao. The devas and those paths that lead outside the mind, methods that take us out of our mind. And sickness and death are definitely demons. What is a mara? The, the, um, the Sanskrit word for this is mara. Mara is the killer. And it, it stops you. It stops your cultivation progress. All of these four kinds of states impede you. You don't get to cultivate once the demons come to block you. Okay, that's their goal. They are the uh, foe, the foe of the Buddha. They want to be in control of all in the desire realm. Once you're out of the desire realm, you are no longer troubled by these. Right? Once you're in the dhyanas, if you live as a deva of the Brahma heaven, you're in the dhyana states. These demons, the, the de skanda devas, the uh, Deva Putra Maras don't bother you anymore because you're above their realm. So if we're not there, if we don't have Dhyana Samadhi, they want to control us. And the Buddha is there to get us out of that realm. So of course they oppose the Buddha. And you know, part of our founding story is the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, his last test, the Mara's daughters couldn't seduce him, Mara's armies couldn't terrify him, couldn't terrorize him, terrorists, demon terrorists, and Mara himself couldn't confuse him when he appeared just like him. That's one of the best parts of the little Buddha, Keanu Reeves under the tree. It's actually a good part of the film. And um, 
Mara shows up looking just like Keanu Reeves, and Keanu Reeves touches the earth, and the earth says, yep, you're awake. And Mara goes, curses! Rolls his mustache, vanishes. Defeated. So if you, quote, catch a demon, it's going to be somewhere in these states. That's what it means to your cultivation gets impeded. You don't go any further. And if you read the Sharangama Sutra, all those skanda demons, there's that whole refrain that says, uh, if you do not interpret the state as proof of your sagehood, there's no harm. Just continue. Continue to cultivate. However, if you do think that you're enlightened, a sage, then you will be subject to these kinds of influences. Okay? Makes sense? So, interesting stuff here. Um, one thing I like about it, it's really rational. The Buddha is saying, oh, demon states? Yeah, we've heard of those. Here's what they are. Take a look. Here's the Here's how they manifest, and here's what, you know, if you have this problem, here's why. And you go, wow, that's really, like, manageable because it's not, you know, the devil made me do it with a pitchfork and a, and a forked tail and horns in his head. It's like, no, it's one of those four things. So the four kinds of paths of demons, the four demon states cannot destroy these bodhisattvas. They're beyond demons at this point. How about that? Pretty good. All right. So um, we're going to we're going to come back here um, next week and continue. This is page. Let's take, take a look here. We're on page 30. So that'll be our our next uh, next section. And I wanted to, uh, looking at demon states, um, it's kind of fashionable in some uh, parts of the Dharma realm to assume that you've caught a demon state. And people come looking for monks to explain their demon states. And when I was in... Um, Jin Chuan Shi and I were both in Beijing recently, and we had a, a lecture that was attended by a large number of folks from uh, Beijing, Tianjin, and uh, Manchuria. Some people came down from Shenyang, some from Heilongjiang, and some from Liaoning. Riding on the train, they said, for 18 hours to get there for this one lecture. Why? They are Shifu's devotees. And they don't get to see Sherpa's disciples very often. So when we showed up, they were excited about it. And we had a chance to uh, answer questions. And they asked questions. They wrote them down on paper. And my goodness, um, I realized that there are differences um, in interpretations of the Buddha's teaching. <laughs> and uh, in this part of northeastern China, Tianjin, Beijing, and Manchuria, which is a kind of like where, you know, Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island and Maine are in America, that northeastern corner. Those folks have an understanding of monks that the description of being a monk includes the reality that you will have psychic powers. You will have shantong and use them, and if you don't, you are not qualified, they're not what you they would call a monk. Monks are supposed to be able to know the future, know the past, heal illness, be a doctor, uh, able to vanquish foes, to leap over buildings, and fly through the air, and it's expected, you know. So the questions that we got were all about that. Amazing. So I've been uh, bit by bit answering some of them, and I got one here, which I think is... Uh, kind of apropos. Um, let's see, not that. That's not it. Try again. Not that. Let's 
save. It was this one here. Right there. Okay. Here was the first question. Bing Li Shifu. So Chan Yang Shao Shi Jiho Tui Yo Ding Li Xin Chan Dong Yao. So Jede Yo Dung Shi Tu Bupo Shi Yi Li Zhang Ai Hai Shi Xin Li Bugo. I bow to the teacher. After sitting in meditation for two hours, my legs have samadhi. The dust in my mind moves and I feel as there is something there that I cannot overcome. Is this state a result of karmic obstacles or is it that my mind is simply not strong enough? Okay, so now I didn't I didn't talk to this person um, face to face. I just brought the questions home and uh, I'm answering them. You know, uh, in absentia, and gonna, we're going to send it back. So, the question is about a demonic state. I feel as if there is something there. You say, what is it? Uh, you know, there's something there. And so, is it karma, or is it that I'm just not strong enough. All right, so, okay, first of all, the question is about a demonic state according to the person. But the thing that caught my attention immediately was the person wants us to know that they can meditate for two hours. This is called what? It's called selling your cultivation. Advertising your meditation ability. Why are you telling us that you can sit for two hours in meditation? Because you're proud of it. You think that's pretty good. And you make the claim, my legs have samadhi. And I go, oh, which one, the left or the right? How do you know? Is there a samadhi meter that like it goes up and ding, samadhi? In your legs, what about your arms? Your legs have samadhi. Hmm, okay. And then the dust in your mind moves. Okay, you're making a claim that you have samadhi and that you have dust in your mind that moves. It's illegal among the Sangha to claim that you have samadhi. I don't do that. If I tell you, if I say, oh, you know, hey, by the way, Jin Husher has got samadhi. Did you know that? He's got real samadhi, real dingli. You should make offerings to him. Right? Now, first of all, I wouldn't say that especially if it were true, because that would be hurting him and the whole monastery, right? If there's one, I just heard a kookaburra over here. Ali agrees, this is not right. If one person in the monastery has samadhi, everybody will want to rush to make offerings to him, and the other people won't get offerings, right? So the Buddha explicitly forbid this from making this claim. It hurts the person who claims it, and it hurts everybody else around him or her who doesn't make the claim, but who are righteous. You know? Okay, so this person is claiming they have samadhi in their legs. The dust in their mind moves, and there's something there. Yes, there is something there, and it's your big sense of self. The ego is there. It's your pride is there. Affliction. If there's anything there that's demonic, it's the demon of arrogance, the affliction of arrogance. If afflictions are a demon, then arrogance is a demon. So is this state a result of karmic obstacles? In other words, meaning what? Meaning I'm not responsible, right? Oh, well, it happened. Somebody, it's just the demon came in, you know. That's not dharma. Right? A state of karmic, meaning it's not my fault, karmic obstacles, something happened in the past probably. It's like strike three right there. Or is that my mind is not strong enough? No, your understanding of dharma is not strong enough. Right? You are proud of your meditation and you are hoping that something will happen so that you can prove that you got something. You have a self and some state. Let go of the pride in meditation. Meditate. First of all, check your motive. Why do you meditate? That's the first question. If you meditate to tell people about it, you've missed the point. 
right? Maybe you can sit for two hours. That's great. Why don't you sit for three hours? If you're, you know, don't stop at two. Just keep meditating. And most of all, just be humble. And the demons will flee as soon as you stop noticing how long you can meditate. So anyway, this was, I thought, a really good example of vanquishing the, demon, the four kinds of demon states, right? This is the demon of afflictions, which is just bound up in the person's pride in their meditative skills. Being able to meditate is good. Being proud of it is not good. It's just like Liang Wudi, right? Liang Wudi says to Bodhidharma, oh, I built lots of monasteries. I made all these monks into monks. How much merit do I have? A lot, right? And Bodhidharma says, none. And Liang Wudi is really upset. What do you mean, none? Phony monk? So Bodhidharma goes off to Bearsir Mountain near Shaolin Monastery, future home. And stays there facing the wall for years and years and years. And Yang Di just misses out. So, okay, that's kind of interesting as we look at these questions. Um, I'm going to give them over to Madalena when I, when I have a chance to uh, uh, send back to Manchuria. She has the connections with those volunteers. All righty. Uh, any questions? Any comments? What's happening um, this week at CTTB or Gold Mountain? Or is, I'm, at, I'm sorry, Gold Mountain at uh, BBM. You want to make some announcements, Jin Chuan Shi? Okay, I think um, the upcoming weeks we have a couple of events. Um, next week, December 6th, we have the one day walking meditation that's the first Sunday of the month and then the following weekend December 12th and 13th we will have a weekend Amitabha session here at BBM so if you're interested in joining uh, please let us know we'll probably have a sign up sheet pretty soon oh and change um, interested there's a Buddhism for the modern mind on Monday so two days from now okay that's um is that open to the public, or is that a class? Um, no, that one's open for everyone in here. They want to come to Berkeley Monastery. It's it's uh, Doug giving a. I don't know what's the topic now. Does anybody know? We don't know what the topic is. Usually, it has a kind of a, a modern kind of a little bit edgy topic, so we don't know what it mm -hmm. is right now. So, but okay. uh, yep, that's Monday evenings. How? Seven thirty. Yeah. Okay, is that online? I I believe it is, but I don't think it's just being broadcasted widely. It's kind of like this go-to meeting. Um, it's okay. for those who are in the monastery and or at a, at a I think a branch monastery. Okay. Or if they met Doug before, I think I think the idea was to not overwhelm people with Doug straight, <laughs> but have them have an orientation first. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Well, um, the other thing I'm working on is, is this. Um, let's see here. This is an ongoing progress, pro ongoing translation project called Yong Jia Da Shi Zhang Dao Ge. This has been the Song of Enlightenment by Master Yong Jia, and it's been translated four or five times. Available online. We have done it a couple times. Um, early and then not long ago, and I'm I'm doing a further translation, and uh, we have Shurfu singing it. Uh, he sang it in Vancouver, and I was there with my handy dandy tape recorder and taped it. And so we have it sung in Chinese by someone who knows how it should sound, and we're working on it in in English and. Uh, I think because it's a gu, this word here, song, it's to be sung. It's um, songs often have refrains. They're meant to be sung, not recited, not chanted with palms together. They're kind of rough and ready often. Um, and apparently the melody that Master 
Yongjia, the master from Yongjia, is a place. Um, the, the the melody that he got was a street melody, kind of the the same melody you'd hear kids skipping rope to in the side lot, and the melody that you'd hear people uh, humming in the market and things. Those kind of melodies, common melodies, and the the, the thoughts, the verses in Zhang Daoke also came from all sides. They were proverbs in the monastery. They were ideas that arose out of meditation. They were snippets of poetry pasted in together to uh, one flavor, which is the sense of liberation. And when I read the Song of Enlightenment, it is really brash and raw and fresh. He's, it's the way I experience good hip hop, spoken word poetry. Um, the Song of Enlightenment's right there. For example, um, let's see here. He says, Um, number four. Okay. Um, okay, here he goes. Right here. No blessings. No, no offenses. No blessings. No loss. No gain. Ji mie. There's the word we just saw in the sutra. In extinction, in, in nirvana, in the nature of nirvana, do not ask, do not look. Be lie, this dusty mirror has never been rubbed or polished, but now it shines so brightly, it reflects everything entirely. Okay, so no good, no evil, no loss, no gain. In stillness of tranquility, don't ever even ask. This dusty mirror was never polished or, sh or rubbed. Now it shines completely and everything is revealed. So here's what we've got. Right here. Goodbye to good and evil. Goodbye to loss and gain. In stillness and tranquility, you never ask again. Your wisdom mirror was coated thick. You never wiped it clean. Now it shines without a flaw. There's nothing you can't see. <clears throat> so it's kind of a fresh, um, uh, not polite, kind of um, take no prisoners, direct feeling. So now, having got the lyrics, we need a, a melody. And uh, Jody Stecker, our uh, living, walking encyclopedia of folk traditions, um, has uh, came up with the Blind Fiddler melody. And the Blind Fiddler, uh, Jody and uh, um, Henry Kaiser and uh, actually Peter Rowan, was there with Alan Sanaki and Josh Michael, and we all put together. We found the Blind Fiddler as this really traditional uh, melody, which suits it very well. It goes like this: Goodbye to good and evil. Goodbye to loss and gain. In stillness and tranquility, you never ask again. Your wisdom mirror was coated thick. You never wiped it clean. Now it shines without a flaw. There's nothing you can't see. Now I'll do one more and then we may have to stop. Um, the Chinese here. This is okay. I picked out some verses. Uh, on topics. That was the mind, and this one is the mani pearl. Here it is. Uh, 
Here it is right here. Moni Zhu, Mani Pearl, Ren Bu Shi, people do not recognize it. Rulai Zhang Li, but inside the Tathagata's treasury, Qin Shou De, you get it yourself. Right within the Tathagata's treasury is where you get it yourself. Liu Ban Shen Yong, Kong Bu Kong, six kinds of psychic abilities. It's empty, but it's not empty. One perfect round light. It is form, and yet it's invisible. Okay, so the Mani Pearl, nobody knows it. The Tathagata's treasury is where you find it yourself. Six kinds of psychic powers, empty but not empty. One single round light, form and yet invisible. Okay, so wishful fulfilling pearl. Here we go. This is the Mani Pearl, a treasure still unknown. Look to the Tathagata, but find it on your own. It works in six uncanny ways. It's here, and now it's gone. A single round and perfect light. Now it's hidden. Now it's shown. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. That gets jammed up. Here we go. This is the money pearl, a treasure still unknown. Look to the Tathagata, but find it on your own. It works in six uncanny ways, it's here and now it's gone. Single round and perfect light, now it's hidden, now it's shown. Okay, okay, enough of that. So that's the uh, Song of Enlightenment, a project still unknown. Okay, uh, notes, save that one. Here we go. Dedication of merit. Time to bring this to an end. And I think we got the technology pretty much uh, working for us this time. And if we can just um, stick with this. Uh, system, I think we should be able to deliver the lecture. Apologies for last week. Uh, Remlins uh, took us down last week, but we're back. Um, this is my uh, 1930s, probably a silver tone uh, parlor guitar. No three pieces of it are original. It has been made to put together from <laughs> But probably the soundboard is the only thing that's original. Everything else has been added from others. So it's a clone guitar. And charming. Charming. Made by the guitar repairers up in Brisbane. Here we go. Dedication of merit. Let us uh, put our palms together and send out the goodness around the world wherever you would like it to go. Dispel the darkness of their endless 
Okay, Jinchuan Shir, do you want to lead everybody in bowing to the Buddha? And we'll see you all next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye bye.